Luna, I think what I was taking from what you were saying was was that, as, as Ken was mentioning, yeah, we give all the credit often to Mike Arise, right? And mm-hmm. and and we that's the rock star, you know, in in no pun intended, but it is the rock star of of the fungal community. And and Jeff Lowenfels really brings us out in in teaming with Fungi, but but as you're saying, it it's so much more about well what what had to take place to create the environment for mycorrhizae to be um effective mm-hmm. and, and and i think i think that's where we, we got to give credit to to the the roadies who are making that rock star look so good which to me is is the rise of pus that and and in the mucor right yeah, hundred percent. You know, and uh, there's a reason why it's in you know every soil everywhere. It's it's super ubiquitous, and it's it, inside every fruit and vegetable. And you leave you know your pasta out for long enough, and it's going to start start growing this uh, this lower fungi that that helps break it down. Right. This is just how soil functions. So we're implementing uh, part of just how all soils work everywhere, and like encouraging it in our soil. Um, Although I did find an interesting uh, study just recently talking about having too high level, too high of levels of rhizopus in your soil um, for cannabis cultivation specifically actually affects terpene um, production. So that's a really interesting piece of information as well. And, and can you share a little bit more about that study in terms of what what they yeah. why they thought there was that uh, uh, negative correlation? God, I should have had this prepared. I should have brought it up earlier. No, no, and, uh, and, and you can always just send us the link too. We we can always revisit it. And uh, I, yeah. I think Leighton's going to be kicking himself uh, for not being here. So we will. We'll, uh, mm-hmm. I'm I'm so so. Uh, you no, know, I, I think this is this is super. So, but it, 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 even at your thought process around why that might be. Mm, immediately, the first thing that comes to my mind is competitive exclusion. Um, when you have such a high number of one kind of biology, you know, you're kind of filling up the opportunity for other um, forms of biology to mm-hmm. come in and secrete their specific um, organic acid profiles, um, you know, enzyme profiles and things like that um, to kind of, and I feel like that probably would limit the diversity um, when you're filling all the space with, with one particular kind of lower fungi. And, uh, and, and did, did, was it, was a study essentially saying that there was, um, less robustness in the terpene profile, so there weren't as many terpene. Or no, so a, a, like an actual decrease in the um, like concentration, like the percentage of terpenes in the flower. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what type what type of conditions would I, as a grower, end up creating where I have more rhizopus uh, fungi? What kind? Of, well, I mean, immediately I would think that you're probably maybe uh, probably too wet <laughs> would be the first thing that comes to mind. Um, too much not fully decomposed organic matter, like too much fresh organic matter. I keep bumping my table and shaking my camera. Um, so I'm big on not adding a whole bunch of fresh organic matter that hasn't decomposed already. I'm really big on like earthworm castings um, and other like mesophilic composting processes. I'm not a huge fan of thermophilic composting. I know it's very traditional and, it, and it's very effective. Um, I just prefer um, insect-based products like insect frass and earthworm castings. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they're safer. They have larger diversity. They haven't gone through this thermophilic process that kind of um, limits um, the amount of diversity. Yeah. So I'm not big on, on adding tons of mulch or adding tons of fresh organic matter. I know that some people are really big on like throwing fruit directly on their beds and throwing, um, you know, a lot of grain or um, just things like that. Things that haven't been fully broken down. I'm not super big on that. Like I'll take my, my plant matter that I've pulled, like when I'm defoliating or lollipopping and dry it like separately a lot of times and then reintroduce it and then like, you know, so that it's more uh, brown and then add that as my mulch um, just because I don't want I don't want the biology that's there to break down fresh organic matter near the stalks of my plants, right? I don't want them like super close to the stalks mm-hmm. of my plants. I feel like that's a, a great way to like have like crown rot um, or uh, just, you know, breakdown of, of the the plant at the base of the plant, stuff like that. Um, I, think, uh, I, think, I think that's a, that's a, 
a phenomenal observation. Um, it, it, in at an energetic level, in in some ways, it it is sending two different messages, right? You've got a very decomposition message message that's being sent by by trying to 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 break down things. Like in in biodynamics, you know, we we really do have to measure our energies, and sometimes you do not want a breakdown energy at the same time as what you're trying to get a growth energy, right? And so you're trying to balance the energy. So so the idea of of throwing fresh mulch and trying to decompose at the same time, yeah, may not be the and, and and that's why it's it's interesting because you know for me, I, I'm often making recommendations where if if you're leaving the rootstock in a living soil bed, um, I I actually do want to put a perhaps a fungal dominant compost extract or tea or a biodynamic um, barrel compost where mm -hmm. I'm trying to break down that material, but at the same time, right next to it, I'm trying to grow a new plant. And 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 I'm I'm just wondering if is am I sending mixed messages to to the whole living soil system there? Definitely. definitely.